Hi, this is John Quinlan. Welcome to Forward Forum, our first show of the 2016 year. And we're here at the Sun Prairie Media Studios, uh, the Media Center Studios, talking about an event in the news this week, but one that has uh, resounding relevance to the whole rest of the year and hopefully a place where positive things will begin to happen uh, after a time of discord and misunderstanding, and that's, that's Iran the country of Iran, and I'm very pleased to have in studio my guest, Bonnie Block. Uh, Bonnie, uh, many of you know, has been a prolific presence on this show. She joined us uh, last spring in the context of her work uh, to counter uh, drone warfare and its manifestations here in Wisconsin at Folk Field, and uh, she spoke to us both before and after the time that she spent uh, having gone to jail for justice to protest those matters. She is someone who has a long history of uh, work on behalf of peace and justice, including in the context of the Wisconsin Network for Peace and Justice, the United Nations Association of Dane County, and countless other organizations and efforts over the years. Bonnie Block, welcome to Forward Forum. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Glad to have you back. Um, so, uh, you know, so part of the reason for doing this in terms of the here and now, uh, and as this airs, is just to put in context uh, events of this past week as you know, uh, there were two U.S. Uh, ships uh, that were um, that wandered into Iranian uh, territorial waters. Uh, they were detained. Uh, the, the soldiers detained. There's some images we'll share in just a moment. I think that mm -hmm. that um, that had uh, different effects on people who saw them, who did or didn't place them in context. Well, this this also takes place at a time when uh, a very important treaty uh, is coming into play in terms of an attempt to, uh, to diminish uh, the notion of Iran becoming a nuclear power. Uh, it comes after a long period of sanctions against Iran. Uh, I think some folks are concerned that things could light up and they could go the wrong way. There are issues of trust uh, involved, uh, just a lot of things to sort through. So having said that and trying to put it in the, <laughs> in the context of a question, could you help put in perspective uh, both some of what happened this past week, how it fits into that bigger picture of uh, relationship of trust between the U.S. and Iran? Well, I have been very interested in what's happening in Iran because in 2005 in December, we were there on the first delegation from the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And so I've sort of followed what's going on in, in Iran because of that. And I am so struck by the difference um, in how we treat Iran versus how we treat countries like Saudi Arabia or Israel or you know, most of the rest of the world. We have this enemy image. And I, I think this whole recent event um, has raised a lot of that again. And to me, it's very questionable as to exactly what these two small boats were doing on an island that belongs to Iran. Um, you know, maybe they just did have engine trouble, or maybe they were trying to um, raise some issues or do some surveillance. I don't know for sure. It, but it is always um, a matter of the U.S. sees itself as having the right to intervene anywhere in the world. And when another country treats, we would do exactly the same thing if there were Iranian boats off the coast of New York City. And yet, apparently, some of the right feels that that is unacceptable. And it, it, this double standard and hypocrisy is what really concerns me about what's happened with our relationship with Iran. So just to touch on a specific manifestation of that, in the Bush administration, Iran was named as one of the five axes of evil in Correct. the world. And I was talking to our friend uh, Majid Sarmadi last night and just saying that set things back in terms of that construction. And, you know, let's face it, uh, diplomacy and the efforts to reach out to other global powers have always been conducted with people we have had profound disagreements with who've seen um, as enemies. But, you know, look at World War II, folks that were our enemies within a few right. years have become our allies. Look at experiences in Vietnam and Cuba and many other places that we thought were in perpetual conflict, but now we're in relationship and finding common ground. And I, I think we really need to realize that Iran is a crossroads place. Yeah. It, it is neither Arab, it's not East, it's not West. It has a long and storied history with some of the best inventions having come out of the Persian Empire. And, and really it was a fairly democratic place. Um, and 
the people of Iran, when we were there, they do not see us as the enemy. It was so wonderful to be greeted by people uh, when they heard us speaking English. And, oh, where are you from? And what do you think about Iran? And a thousand times welcome, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. You know, it was, it was such a different picture yeah. than what we are told in the media. And, and I think the people of Iran also get that there's a difference between the people and the governments. And, and a lot of animosity is at that governmental uh, level. And I, I think the more we can do in terms of diplomacy, in terms of people-to-people -people relationships, the better off we will be. You know, uh, two great examples of people who can Google online. Um, Anthony Bourdain, who, who does a show on, on, on travel for, for CNN, mm -hmm. he came in with all kinds of preconceptions about how right. would he be treated and everything, and right. just found such a wonderful, rich, hospitable place. Yes. Um, Steve Dees, if I remember the name correctly, PBS, the, the, the travel correspondent, um, who usually does European travel, but mm -hmm. did an amazing show on Iran. Again, just really brought up right. all, the, all the great discoveries, all the great connections that were made there. Mm -hmm. But that, that's very typical, it sounds like, of your, your uh, connection there. Oh, very there. much so. And we got to meet such interesting people. Um, one of my favorites was we met with a group, uh, a women's environmental group, and they showed us pictures of they were protesting in front of the bulldozers uh, to prevent a four-lane highway from going into an Ice Age forest. And it was, it was so much like, you know, groups here. And my favorite thing about that was they, they told us about what kinds of things they do. But my favorite was they had all the usual committees, but one of them was they had a committee for unforeseen events. Yeah. And I've, I've been telling that to groups. We all need that kind of a committee. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we, we had a, oh absolutely magnificent meal in uh, the home of, um, he was a friend of, of the travel agent that was with us. And it, there was just this, we, we sat on the floor on the gorgeous oriental rug and there were multiple dishes of wonderful food, way more than we could eat. But again, that's part of their hospitality. You have to have more than they can eat to show that you really want the people there and that you're being hospitable. And it was just, and one night we, we went, we were in um, Tehran, Qom, Shiraz, Esfahan, and Natanz. But one night we got into the airport in um, Shiraz and it was late, it was dark, you know, we were straggling off the bus with our luggage and there's a person there to greet us, and he says again, welcome, a thousand times welcome. We are so glad to have you here, and if we can do anything to make your visit better. And, and the guide that was with us the whole time said, not bad for the axis of evil, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, to come back to that, just the whole idea that we, we paint with a broad brush people of a country of multiple uh, ethnic identities and languages and, and diverse geography, but also a country that's struggling like we are to overcome extremist forces that are trying to clamp down on and be tyrannical and to make everybody think the same way. But pluralism and democracy are alive and well in, our, in Iran, and we just simply have to connect with the people that are advancing it. We have to support them and lift them up and not see them as the enemy. Correct. And it, again, it's not that dissimilar to the struggle we're going through in this country no, right now. No, it isn't. I, you know, they are a country in many ways like ours because they have had a history of internal conflict, like our civil war. They've had the, you know, the 1979 revolution. Um, and I'm not in favor of a theocracy by any means. But again, um, this is a young country. I, I think over 60% are under the age of 25. Yeah. The first people we saw, they were in, you know, the women were wearing the hijab, but at the airport, women were in customs, women were everywhere, women were on TV. And, and more women go to college in, Tehran, in um, Iran than men. Yeah. So it, it isn't this, you know, I, I, again, I don't really like the hijab. But, but some women see that as a way of expressing a cultural identity. And, and I don't think we can judge you know, about that. And I, I think also this is a very young population and I think that, that just by definition, there, is going to, there are gonna be major demographic changes just as there are gonna be here, yeah. where we are not gonna be totally white any longer. And, and so I think you know, we need to sit back and let them control their destiny. We're not in charge of every country in the world. And I, I think it's partly um, the whole thing that happened in 1979, you know, the revolution there. 
part of that was because of a very long history of U.S. intervention. You know, in 1953 was their first democratically elected um, Prime Minister Mossadegh, and the CIA overthrew that government and yeah. imposed the Shah. And and then, you know, it was very a very autocratic rule. And there were there were really two forces. There was the the exiled uh, Shiite. Uh, clerics, but there was also a very vibrant people's movement. Yeah, and um, for a while it wasn't clear which would you know would control, but it, it now obviously is um, the the uh, Shiite clerics. And yet, there there are a lot of changes. I you know even the thing with the hijab, you see young women. Yeah, and you know they have a scarf, but it, it hardly covers most of their hair. Uh, you know, there there's a lot of pushing of the envelope. And, and I think that's a real positive sort of thing. When a country with 60% of its population less than 25, again, it's something in this country, too, that we have hopes that younger generations will have different paradigms, won't be so stuck in the same old way of doing right. things. We'll begin to explore right. new ways of being and doing. Right, and I, and I think seared into our memory is the hostage taking um, in, in 1979. And yet part of that was a, f a fear that, again, the Shah was going to be put back into power. He was at that point, I think he had cancer. Anyway, he, the U.S. let him yeah. come to New York for, for medical care. And, and that really was a very fearful thing because it was like, you know, our revolution is going to be overthrown again and, and you know, we'll have this autocratic ruler imposed by the West. So I remember in the 70s, you know, Barbara Walters interviewing him. And again, so much of the lens in which we view things is through American eyes and, and supposedly our own best interests. But those interests, when they circumvent the interests of another people, they really aren't in the longer term the best way to go. Yeah. And so we, we painted that the Shah was our friend and he was Western and he was friendly and then juxtaposed that with the images of what was happening in Iran. Mm -hmm. and. That, that's, just, that's just the wrong lens through which to view well, things like this. Well, the other thing is it is extremely clear that, that the embassy in Tehran was being used to spy. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of the documents were, were shredded, but they put them back together. You know, it was very clear that we were, were spying on another country. And, you know, again, how would we feel if that was happening to us? Yeah. If, if the Iranian embassy was, you know... In the middle of Washington, D.C., right. on Connecticut Avenue, or wherever it is, I can't remember. But, yeah, if, if that were happening in the middle of our country, we wouldn't, we wouldn't tolerate that. Yeah, we wouldn't, we, we'd yeah. be very angry about it. Yeah. And so I think that we really need to put ourselves in another shoes. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying Iran is perfect, but neither is the U.S. And, and this whole, the whole thing that's been coming on with the, the nuclear issue, uh, when we were there, that was one of the questions we asked because the IEAE, uh, the International Atomic Energy uh, Agency was was already there doing inspections, and we asked, you know, why do you want nuclear weapons? And they said, no, we don't want nuclear weapons. What we want is oil is going to run out eventually. We want nuclear power, and we want nuclear medicine. You know, the peaceful uses. And under the atomic uh, the uh, nonproliferation treaty, Iran has every right to do that. They've signed it. They've allowed inspections, and they're following that law. And yet we are acting as though they have, you know, a whole batch of missiles and, and nuclear weapons ready to attack. They don't. They're years, they were, even before this treaty, they were years away. And now that's been backed up at least 15 years, maybe longer. But interestingly, what we were in Qom, Qom and uh, met it's with... Holy City. Yeah. The Holy City, like Vatican City here, or not here, but in Italy. Uh, and they... The clerics that talked with us says, nuclear weapons are anti-Islamic. The prophet said that we must not pollute a well during war. We must not poison it. And nuclear weapons do way more than poison a well. You know, they really can destroy life. You know, you have nuclear famine, the whole, that whole batch of, of awful results if nuclear weapons are used. And they said, no, we, we are not doing that. And a part of it, I think, I think even if there was development going on, I think a part of it was that Iran feels very threatened. You know, they are surrounded by our ally Israel, which is nuclear armed, Saudi Arabia, which we support no matter what they do, Pakistan 
in India, both all of which have nuclear weapons. Yeah. And and so part of it is a a matter of is feeling self defense, a need for self defense. And Mar, if actually we could jump ahead to the the map of that region just to give uh, a sense of that geography that, that Bonnie's evoking. Um, so yeah, as you see, surrounded by the countries that you're mentioning, and right. then. Uh, if we could jump back to that larger uh, image of the region, um, you know, is, you know, one perception, you know, seeing this uh, is, you know, again, the proximity to all those different countries where things are playing themselves out. But as you pointed out, this is a crossroads of the world, and it's, it's a huge country. And not to diminish the people or the accomplishments or the things that have happened in Iraq, but it's considerably larger. I mean, you know, it, it may be, I mean, meaning it is just, it just. Uh, a major presence in that part of the world, a place where so much happens, where so many things flow mm -hmm. through it, and it makes sense for us to have a good relationship with the people who are there. Right. We, I mean, it, it's been interesting to to watch how we treat Saudi Arabia, which is, you know, probably in some ways a Sunni capital, um, and and you know, and you juxtapose with the sh more Shia German the sh traditions right. of Iran. Right. Iran. And mm -hmm. and it seems it seems to be okay for Saudi Arabia to be a major power in the region, but not for Iran. And and that does not make any sense. Yeah. And if anything, the really extreme form of Islam, the the Wahhabi uh, version, comes from Saudi Arabia. And if we go back to 9/11, what was it? 17 of the 19 hijackers. Are, are were, were from Saudi Arabia. Right. They weren't from Iran, and yet we we call this you know we call them terrorists and that they support terrorist network networks. Uh uh, I I don't think that's true at all. We we were at one time in Morocco and it was interesting. The, there's a huge mosque that Saudi Arabia has built mm. in Casablanca. You know they have been funding and ex exporting a lot of really the the military. Uh, extremists who are mostly Sunni, you know. So, so again, this this making a boogeyman of of the Shiite part of the Islamic religion, you know. I think in some ways, you know, I, I sometimes think that maybe um, for Iran or for for Islam, they're in a pre-Reformation mm. kind of thing. But remember what happened between the Catholics when the Martin Luther and the Protestants came about. You know, yeah. there was a lot of stuff going on there too and and none of it is helped by bombing mm. or by by imposing sanctions you know when we were in Iran they were talking about sanctions and how during the time of the Shah we had sold them all sorts of airplanes all sorts of equipment but now they couldn't get parts yeah and and there was still money that we froze at the time of the embassy takeover that they hadn't gotten back and then the more recent sanctions I think it was a hundred either 110 or 150 billion dollar dollars in oil assets that were frozen in Asia in the US what would the US do if our government if somebody some other government took a hundred plus billion dollars from us and froze it yeah would we think that was a friendly move no yeah yeah well, anyway, there's so many different things we, sh we can expand upon as we move further into the hour. But as you know, part of the purpose, and this is, re you know, of this hour, which is resonant with other things that we've done uh, together on, on radio and television over the years, is, again, to take some of these images, these incendiary images that are seared into our minds, and replace them with uh, pictures of a land and a people that few or few people understand or become familiar with. Right. So that's one of the things we hope to do. Before we do that, just to come back to what we were alluding to, though, I think, again, so many people still associate, at least, you know, of our generations, uh, you know, that, that, that time of the takeover of the U.S. Embassy right. and the other things. And, Mara, if we could uh, first move to that first picture uh, evoking the banner of peace, uh, okay, well, actually, we'll, uh, yeah, let's go back to that just briefly. So, again, to mention, this is a group called the Fellowship of Reconciliation. It's a group that, uh, again, sees that the importance of human connection, bringing people mm -hmm. from this country and, and, and other places in the world into Iran to become familiar with the people and the land. And, and so, so all the folks, uh, the, the women who in this picture are dressed in that traditional dress mm -hmm. of the hijab, as were you when you visited. Yes, we did that. And... Uh it's hot, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, what, one of the other interesting images of people, you know, is young people. Yeah. M most young people speak English because they do teach it in their schools. And how many people in this country speak Farsi? I mean, it was they would come up in the streets 
and want to talk with us. And, and we're so welcoming. It, it, I just, that image just over and over and over again. So we, we, in just a minute, we'll, we'll move quickly into images like that. And yeah. you'll see this on, on, a, on a video that, uh, that our viewers can probably find on YouTube. Uh, we're going to do two things. One is to show uh, a very beautiful video with, with traditional Iranian, mu Iranian music that, um, that, uh, uh, that evokes the people of the land. So if you, go, if you go to YouTube and put in Iran and people, you'll find this probably. And then as well, another beautiful video of Iran and the landscapes. Um, but again, uh, just to come back to though, I think part of what we're trying to undo, and, and Mara, we'd started uh, scrolling through that, is those several pictures that we have of uh, the the attack on the U.S. embassy, the takeover in 1979. And so again, images of folks scaling the walls of the embassy. Um, uh, this image of uh, of uh, Khomeini, the, um, the the imam who was the the ostensible leader of Iran at the time. Uh, again, seeing the, the bringing down of the American flag. Um, again, you know, and, and uh, something here, uh, actually, let's go on ahead to that next slide. This is in 1979, juxtaposed with images that people saw this week uh, taking place on these boats in the middle of the Persian Gulf, uh, where American ships that had wandered into Iranian water were uh, t were uh, were seized, uh, and 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 the American uh, soldiers who were part of this. This is an image that's there. Again, I think if you juxtapose that image of that earlier time back in 1979 with these images, it's one of the reasons why I think people had an initial negative reaction, thinking this is happening all over again, and these folks are being demeaned. But the reality behind this picture. And what would actually happen, as you pointed out, it's questionable. Why did the Americans wander in to the uh, to these waters? If we could go one more slide forward, again, this happened on um, on, on Farsi Island, uh, which is a military installation. It's clearly Iranian territory. Uh, this is where the the soldiers were, U.S. soldiers were held briefly. You know, on the other hand, um, by all accounts at this point, uh, they were treated very humanely, given food and water. Uh, you pointed out someone was, you know, objecting the fact they had to take their shoes off. Well, generally, when you have an Iranian meal and you crouch on the floor, you take your shoes off and you enjoy it. And it's great food, probably. Um, but uh, and the other the other reality to evoke here is that within 24 hours, they had been released. And in an earlier time when we didn't have contact, and we go on to the next slide, when Secretary Kerry was not in relationship with Foreign Minister of Iran, uh, Zarif, that might not have happened. Exactly. And so I think it shows how, how diplomacy works and how it is supposed to work. We are, are this, this idea that um, there has to be a fight whenever there's a disagreement. No, uh, you, people can work out, and, and it's clear that, that Iran and the U.S. worked this out very quickly, and under the law of the sea, that's, that's how it happens. Um, and I, I think also the we have another opportunity with the um, the nuclear they call it the nuclear deal, but you know what the new treaty um, which will uh, prevent Iran from you know getting nuclear weapons. I think they just shipped a whole lot of their enriched uranium to Russia, and you know and this wasn't just a deal between the U.S. and and Iran. This was was six countries in the world. And, and an understanding, I think, that we have to work out our conflicts and not go to war. Right. It's a very complicated arrangement, and uh, there are certainly measures in place if, if Iran were to go back on some of what it's doing. There are new sanctions that can be put in place. But just to touch on it briefly, and then I want to get quickly into some of these, mm -hmm. these, these images that will give yes. our, our viewers a chance to, to see the people and the landscapes. Um, you know, but sanctions, you know, are seen as this simple solution sometimes. You know, that we're going we're gonna to clamp down and squeeze them out economically or whatever. But the folks who are the victims of what happens with sanctions are generally not the powers that be of the leaders. They're going to get what they no. need. Uh, and, and this really hurts the people. And again, in a lot of sense, we need to hold and lift up the, the majority of the people of Iran who are seeking moderate solutions, who are seeking... Mm -hmm. change that honors tradition and yet that moves people into the 21st century. Right. I think that the whole um, disagreement was something that was good for Iran because a lot of their budget is based on oil revenues. And so, as you said, people are hurt. So 
that was that was a good thing, and I think a lar large part of the reason. I think also the very fact that we did a treaty is a much more respectful relationship. It's a give and take relationship. Yeah. It it says yes, we are we are all uh, countries of the world, and we we you know we'll work these things out, and and I think it is a good model. And and the you know the brouhaha that there's been about somehow um, you know we're weak and we're uh, we're being harmed by this. No, I mean, it, it is basically a win-win. Just a quick juxtaposition, you know, so one of the other axes of evil countries is North Korea. That's a whole other show for another time. <laughs> but us being in engagement and in dialogue means that although the current ruler, the young ruler, is probably very egotistical, tyrannical, Autocratic. all the other things yes. that we were talking about, there are moderate forces that needed to be lifted up that, that when diplomacy is in, engaged, we have a chance to be in conversation with those folks, but the same parallel happens with Iran. And again, if we just yes. demonize and blanketly say everybody is our enemy, that, we're not gonna get anywhere. No, we're not. Yeah, so so as we've alluded to, um, I think resonant with your trip, and we'll have a chance to talk about that in further detail in a moment, we wanted to share a couple of different videos, and we'll start with this video. Uh, I think there's a, there's a explanatory credit that explains its genesis and the, its creator. Uh, but uh, I think it's really important for these next several minutes just to embrace these images of a diversity of people in many, many different geographic locations of many ethnicities and languages and generations, and for us to see the Iranian people um, in an authentic way. So now, that video. شمالم تا جنوب عشق چه خاک و گندو میدارم صدام یاری کنه باید بگم چه مردمی دارم بگم این حق هیچ کس نیست که با ثروت فقیر باشه کسی که فرش می بافه نباید روح حسیر باشه اگرچه سختی از انسان یک کوه درد می سازه ولی از مردم ما درد داره یک مرد می سازه شمالم تا جنوبم عشق چه خاک و گندو می دارم نام یاری کنه باید بگم چه مردمی دارم نگاه کن بچه های کار چجور تو آب و آتیشن توی این روزهای سخت کمک خرج پدر میشن من و تو مردمی هستیم که گج از رنج میسازیم به این تاریخ خوشیدی به این فرهنگ می نازیم من و تو مردمی هستیم که آینده تو مشت ماست که از هفتاد نسل قبل هزار استور پشت ماست شمالم تا جنوبم پش چه خاک و گندو می دارم صدا یاری کنه باید به 
بگم چه مردمی دارم Yeah, there's some incredible images against oh, you, probably yeah. evocative of what you saw. Right, right. It's a very diverse uh, country. Uh, as I said, majority of people are under 25, and kids are kids anywhere in the world. Yeah. I mean, it was such fun to see them. And and I think the other, we think of, I think, Iran being a sort of uh, uniform gray kind of a place, but there's so much color. And we, we actually, some of the places we got to go see, we, we did go to um, an art museum, and it was really quite wonderful in terms of, mm. of what we saw. And we, we traveled um, and met lots of different kinds of people. Um, Fellowship of Reconciliation is an international pacifist organization, celebrated its 100th anniversary last year, actually this year. Um, and uh, it, as a result, we went to um, a lot of the religious sites we met with people in the Jewish synagogue in Tehran. It, there have been Jews, you know, in Iran since biblical times. And they pointed out that, that was where the wise men came from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we went to a Baha'i temple. We went to a Zoroastrian temple. There's still a few um, people who practice that religion. Uh, we went to um, a, a absolutely gorgeous mosque. Um, I think it was in Shiraz, and it was just this glittering mosaic of glass. It was just an amazing thing. We talked to some women um, there, and, and again, they were very welcoming. They were very interested in the fact that we were there, um, and, and it was a place that women especially come to pray for their children. Um, we, we also, in Colm, as I mentioned, we met with clerics, and so, we really, you know, there, there is freedom to practice. Oh, we also went to an Orthodox church um, uh, while we were there, and the priest was, was were very welcoming. And, and both Christian and Jew did not feel that they were being discriminated against. There were, there were specific, there were seats in Parliament for the other religions, and they, they really felt perfectly comfortable. Baha'is, on the other hand, there is some, some um, maybe persecution is the right word. And partly it's because uh, um, Muslims feel that the Muhammad was the last prophet, and Baha'is say yeah. Baha'u'llah, you know, is the newest one, and so so that's the basis for for this. And, and I don't want to it's not diminish good. the significance of that. We, no, we have, we have it's not a good thing. <laughs> some good friends who who are Baha'i who who come out of that tradition, uh, right. severe persecution and yeah. death and other things. Yeah. But yeah. But but for the people of the book, as they call it, yeah, that isn't true. Uh, and um, there, you know, they, it works. Uh, we also got to go to visit with young people who were being trained in um, journalism at um, a university in Tehran, and they they were really interested in what um, you know what what we were doing, why we were there, and they had this strong feeling that we really needed to start, you know getting to know each other, and their, their big things, they were very angry about the money that we st had still frozen from 1979, you know, Iranian money. They were, were asked about why are you imposing the sanctions when all it does is, is hurt us, and there had been a recent plane crash of an American plane that they can't get parts for. Mm. And they really felt that, you know, we were responsible for that. And then it was this question, you know, why, why do Americans hate us? So, uh, you know, so it, it's a very, you know, you get right. a very different perspective of what, what's going on there. Two general observations. I mean, so, so it sounds like you had remarkable access. I guess my expectations, maybe going into a place like Iran, was that access would be severely limited. But, but you got to go to quite a variety of places. We did. We did. Um, actually, FOR is no longer doing those trips in part because 
Iranian groups felt it was getting dangerous for them to meet with Americans okay. because we might be spies. Mm. You know, and it's really a shame because for about 10 years there were regular, well, maybe not quite, nine years, I guess. I, it stopped a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, I think we need to do much more of exactly that kind of thing of, of uh, you know, meetings, establishing relationships, and, and the kinds of things that, that make for peace. And the other thing that, that I came away from, because the year after we went to Iran, my husband and I went to Israel and Palestine. Yeah. And there is this amazing double standard of, of you know, sort of Israel can't do any wrong and Iran can't do any right. And, and the nuclear issue, you know, Iran has signed the treaty, they are enriching uranium, but they have a right to do that, and they've allowed inspections. On the other hand, Israel has not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty. They have never allowed inspections. They have 200 nuclear weapons. And the whistleblower that you know, said, yeah, we have the weapons, was held in solitary confinement for decades. Mordecai Vanuno was his name. Mm -hmm. and, and so there is a very different standard here. And the same is true in terms of India and Pakistan. You know, they have nuclear weapons and we aren't saying you've got to disarm. Right. So, so I think that for Iranian people, you know, they, they have good reason to feel they're being discriminated against when they see that, I think, very hypocritical uh, double standard. And then, and then this whole issue of the, Iran does support Hezbollah and, and they're enemies of, of Israel. On the other hand, Israel has been, um, you know, has bombed and taken over land from Egypt, um, from Syria, you know, from Lebanon, from Jordan, and they've occupied the West Bank and Gaza for 60 years now. So, so why, why are we, why are we doing this? The subject of another show, but I mean, while Israel is physically small, it is not a weak place. And sometimes there's that perpetuation. We are surrounded by these powerful Arab partners, give, you know, due to all of the military this country gives. You know, and, it's and, the fourth and, largest and, military in the world. Yeah, and and what you're pointing out that that we look, we take a blind eye to things that happen in terms of very reactionary and very short-sighted Israeli foreign policy. Mm -hmm that I'm sure a lot of folks wouldn't do if it were being perpetuated by our own government, but why do we have this different standard? And then when you add that to the juxtaposition, Iran Iran is bad and Israel is good. Exactly. It's just like, that's a false dichotomy. Well, we realized the last day we were in, in um, Tehran, we realized that the entire time we had been there, we did not see any police officers and we never heard a siren. Yep. We were in Jerusalem and there are military everywhere with automatic rifles and their fingers on the trigger. Especially in Hebron, you know, there are um, settlers, extremist settlers, who have taken over the, the sort of the old market area. There's, I, at that point, I think there were 600 settlers and 1,200 troops to protect them. And, you know, it was such a marked difference in terms of feeling secure. So just to remind our audience, in December of 2005, you went to Iran, and this is in contrast to In November to in 2006, to we the, went, yeah. To, to Israel and the Middle East, yeah. Right. And it, it is, so it's a very different sort of thing, and I, I find myself not understanding how we can be so short-sighted and how we can, I don't think it's in our long-term best interest to be acting this way. So there's one of the things that I empathize with as you're talking is uh, the experience of going to India and around the dinner table in Mumbai talking to young people my own age. It was in my late 20s at the time. And, and both uh, lots of questions about American foreign policy and how we treated mm -hmm. that part of the world and the rest of the world. And yet what was remarkable about that is that, at least in the course of our conversation, um, I didn't have to pretend to be a Canadian because they understood that I was an individual and I might be in a different place than my government was, mm -hmm. which was ostensibly acting in American interests, but maybe not really acting in the best interests of either our people or their people. Right. Anyway, I mean, but, but I mean, that, that is interesting. And anyway, I think what you're saying, again, my, my assumption would be throughout Iran, as you traveled there, given the animosity that exists between the two countries, that you would have had that animosity precipitate out toward you in terms of the way the people um, mm -hmm. treated you. But that really didn't happen, did it? No, it didn't. And, and I think that 
I think that's what's going to ultimately save us, all of us in the world. If, if people, you know, tell their governments, no, we want to live in peace. I, I've been, I, I'm very against um, war. I mean, I'm a pacifist because I don't think war is ever the answer. And Malala, um, I never can pronounce her Malala last name. Malala Chikasa, Right, the, yep. the Nobel Peace Prize winner. She oh, I'm had, sorry. It's Malala y yeah. y Yousafzai. Yeah, Yousafzai. Yep. That's the one I never get. Yep. She, um, her foundation um, has a talk she gave, and there's this staggering statistic. She says that if the world stopped spending, you know, stopped military spending for eight days, it could provide 12 years of quality education for every child on the planet. Mm. I mean, I think that gives you some idea of the, of the priorities we have. You know, half of our budget, our income tax dollars, are spent by the Department of Energy, which is our nuclear, by the Department of Defense, and the VA, which I totally support. You know, we need to support vet veterans we've, who've been hurt. And, and interest on the debt. You know, half of our money. And just think what we could do. I, you know, during the run-up to the Iraq War, one of the best cartoons I saw was one where there was a guy in a suit and a guy in a, a turban. And uh, the, the suit was, the guy was the American. He said, give us Osama bin Laden or we'll send your daughters to college. Yeah. That's not really funny in a way because yeah. that is exactly what we need to do. And, and so, you know, having you know, relationships, having trade, having respectful um, interactions between our governments, all of that is going to make us much more safe. I mean, the thought of, of, of having either a nuclear war or any sort of invasion of Iran, I mean, the whole region would blow up. And, it, and to think that we would even remotely consider that just because we want to show we're big and tough and strong. I, I find that repugnant. It really, it well, just isn't what's good for us. It's not what's good for our country. Just, just to come back to Malala, I believe it's Yousafzai. Uh, you know, again, this young woman, I believe she's just turned 18, but was doing a remarkable world, yeah. you know, role. And for those folks who don't know her story, of course, the, the, the Taliban um, uh, attacked her. Uh, they, they, um, they wounded her. People were concerned, potentially mortally wounded her. Yeah. She went to England to recover, and she has come back from that. But just, I mean, an old soul who just has these amazing insights for us. Yeah. But, but that, that's, I guess, another framework to look at this. To, to, you know, to a certain extent, I think we have trouble in the area of human rights sometimes. Um, understanding there's a difference between being respectful of a culture or religious tradition and other things that are basic matters of universal human rights mm -hmm. uh, is embodied by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the UN. Right. And, and one of those is the, um, the need to develop fully opportunities for women, including education. Yes. So, so again, you know, and that's happening in, that's happening in Iran. Yeah. Um, and, and certainly needs to happen more. Um, I, I think that, but it's a reason for us to be in relationship to encourage that. Exactly. It's those are values we share. I mean, I think I heard that our entire State Department budget is less, or about that, of the University of Wisconsin. Yeah. Now, how can this be when the Pentagon? You know, the Pentagon has never been audited. It can't account for several trillion dollars worth of money it's received, and we allow that. I I find it it very interesting, and I I think in Congress now. I mean. What is happening is, and in the in the uh, presidential campaign, these people are pandering to fear, and that is so dangerous because fear brings out the worst in everybody. Yeah. And and we can act out of courage and compassion, rather than acting out of fear. And and it, you know, people in the we've traveled a fair amount, and people the world over are, they want the same things. You know, they want to be able to raise children. They want to have a living wage. They want to have dignity and respect and be allowed to, to be all they can be. Yeah. And, and why wouldn't we want to do that? And I, I, the other thing I keep thinking about is, and I think the Saran Treaty helps us to do that because we're not going to be at war with them. And then maybe we can all gather around and do something about climate change, yeah. which is really the ultimate danger, I think, to the planet. 
And, and so these things are all connected, and I, I think it's just critical. Exam Iran is one example. But it really is critical that we realize we have got to stop this idea that the use of force, that military spending, that sending troops is going to solve anything. It just makes it worse. I mean, ISIS is a result of the invasion of Iraq and occupation of Afghanistan. Yeah. And, and so what don't we get about that? You know, all the things that you, you talk about, I think, again, resonate with why you and I and other folks have a stake in saying that the United Nations and the international collaboration, seeing ourselves as a global community, is really the way we need to move into this century. Uh, and, and everything that you describe are daunting challenges in terms of ending the scourge of war, um, addressing climate, climate change meaningfully. On the other hand, you know, and, and, and dealing with health issues worldwide, you know, while those are daunting challenges, they're exactly the kind of thing that could bring people together in joint action. Exactly, exactly. And I think there's some hope about that because um, I read a book called Blessed Unrest. I can't remember the author, I think Cockburn. Um, and he, he points out that there are currently at least a million and maybe as many as 10 million grassroots organizations throughout the world he has a hundred page uh, yeah. you know, listing of the kinds of groups. But he says that, that those groups are, are sort of not, they're, they're beneath the mass media's attention. Exactly, yeah. And, and what they, they focus on three things. They focus on the environment, they so focus on social justice and alleviating poverty, and they focus on indigenous rights. And yeah, I mean, that's it. We, we start, you know, and so I, I find some hope in that. Well, I think what you're describing, too, is um, it's, it's a false dichotomy to think that things are either local or global. They can be locally focused and, and, and benefit from all of the... And global issues, right. Uh, but, yeah, they can, again, we, then we connect the dots of the things that are exciting that are happening locally in all those grassroots groups to that larger global picture. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really a time of hope. So as we end out the hour, I, I want to come back to some of these these uh, these larger issues that you're raising, and perhaps that would also be an opportunity to update folks a little bit on drone warfare, which relates <laughs> and is connected to this part of the program, I mean, this part of the world rather. And, and but um, yeah, I think that this larger theme of I mean, just on the face of it, this isn't pie in the sky stuff to talk about about hopes for peace, hopes for removing us from a time when war and the profits that help motivate us to get into conflict, we, we need to move past that, you know, mm -hmm. very quickly. Because <laughs> we've yeah, got more I, It really is a matter do. of survival. Yeah. So so I want to come back to that. But in keeping with kind of, you know, the other purpose of the hour, which is to talk about this wonderful country of Iran. Um, and I think I've been mispronouncing it about half the time, but Iran is is is, is what uh, you know we should be going with here. Uh, but um but anyway the um yeah, it, it, you know, we, we've we've started the the hour, you know, I think by sharing some images of the people of Iran, mm -hmm. but again, you know, I think we, we we perhaps focus in on on just Tehran, which is a beautiful city and an ancient mm -hmm. city and other things, but but it's it's a diverse landscape. I think you know one of the things that surprised me even some of the people images too is being reminded they have snow there. Yes, we little don't mountains. think about there being snow in that part of the world and, and other things, and that's something of course we can empathize with right here right. in the there's Midwest. There's tectonic plates, so there's volcanoes and there's earthquakes right. and there's yeah mountains and deserts and, and it's there's not just big deserts. plateau and there's I mean yeah. But it's, it's also beautiful waterscapes and all kinds of other yes. things, and and uh, you know and you're you're. Uh, travels, I think, were mostly in the north uh, western part of Iran, perhaps. Well, it's sort of the plateau on the plateau, uh, yeah, the, south of the Zagros Mountains. Okay. And um, yeah, most of the population centers are, are in that area. But anyway, we, we'll, uh, the, the, the country is vast, and it's just like this country. We couldn't characterize uh, a landscape in Maine right. as being evocative of Utah or, exactly. or, or Alaska or any other yep. place. So. So, so anyway, I think, I think uh, again, uh, we'll ask our viewers just to sit back for a few moments and appreciate, through this video, the beauty of the landscape of Iran.
wow, there's some amazing images of those landscapes. Yes. Does this bring back memories? Yes, it does bring back memories. Um, Iran is a very beautiful place. And culturally, what's interesting also, you have, you have places like Persepolis, which was um, the, the center of government during the Persian Empire with these magnificent um, carvings and, and pillars and just it, what remains of it. Most of it was destroyed by Alexander, but there, there was just these beautiful sites. And then the other thing that was striking to us, there are parks that are memorials to poets. Mm. You know, we have war memorials. They have memorials to poets like Rumi. And people will come and recite the poetry. Mm. We were in a museum. Oh, this is reminding a little bit of the spoken word traditions and some exactly. of this coming back in this country. Exactly. And we were, we went to a museum of um, the rugs that they make. And again, they had this massive rug. And it wasn't of presidents. It was of poets. Yeah. Uh, and so there is a very rich cultural kind of tradition, along with a varied and beautiful country or landscapes too. Um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful place to visit, and I go again in a heartbeat. And it, it must make it harder for someone who's bound and determined to see somebody as the enemy, as lacking in anything redemptive about them. When you see a beautiful Persian rug, when you hear poetry or music, when you exactly. see the colors, the landscapes, I mean, so that's the that's food, a, the people, yes, yeah, <laughs> all of that. So, so this people-to-people -people contact is really important, and of course, there are opportunities for us here in Madison to interact with folks who are from Iran and to learn mm -hmm. more from them. Yes, there are. Yeah. Well, I want to mention just two things. You know, one is just to to say that uh, we were trying to get this show. Um, you know, put together relatively quickly, and we, we had several folks we had hoped to bring into the show that uh, we will now bring back in in, uh, in, uh, in weeks and months to come to, to kind of flesh out, I think, in greater detail the realities of Iran and its people and its politics and its landscape and to place that, you know, in, in, in relation to current events and uh, relationships with the U.S., so please do keep uh, in touch. Uh, just one other thing I wanted to allude to is that uh, Bonnie, again, was with us earlier for two fascinating shows. We were talking about the scourge of, of drone warfare and how we can counteract uh, its effects here in this country. If you go to forwardforum.net, uh, you can go back to those earlier shows. Just a brief update, this is still a work in progress with the courts, is that right? Yes, we, uh, we vigil the fourth Tuesday of every month at the gates of Volkfield, and about once a year we cross the line. Yep. Uh, usually to de deliver a letter to the commander who has never yet responded or allowed us to see him. Um, and in August, uh, Voices for Creative Nonviolence joined us at the vigil. They had done a 90 mile walk from the jail to Volk Field to point out the injustice and in, in the killing that takes place both in our criminal justice system and with drone warfare. And nine of us crossed the line and we're working our way through the courts. Two of us have had trials. Um, mine was last Friday. And um, I, I asked for community service and the judge is taking that under advisement. So we will see. Because so, we spend so much money on war that human service agencies don't have the resources they need. And so it seemed to me much better than going to jail was doing community service. So we'll bring, yeah, we'll, we'll tie all that together here in our final minutes. Uh, but I just want to mention in the context of all of this, uh, just encourage folks who are listening to know that you can have a voice in all of this. And one of the ways that you can have a voice is to contact members of the congressional delegation and, and to weigh in on issues like this. Um, as we come down to just our last couple of minutes, Bonnie, could, could you help, though, put in perspective those issues that you're talking about that a uh, young woman like Malala raises, hopes for the future, that all of the resources we put into conflict, the machines of war, if, if we could somehow rechannel those resources in terms of things like education and health and the well-being of the world's people, what kind of a world would that be? Much better than it is now, I think. Um, the whole uh, issue of American exceptionalism, you know, I love this country, but we are one of 190 countries in the world, and we have problems, as does every other country. And so this idea that we can use our military force to get our way, to control resources, to you know, create the world in our image, it just 
doesn't work. And, and it's not sustainable. In, in the long run, you know, empires fall. And, and the American empire, if we continue on our way, you know, we'll destroy ourselves with nothing else with all the money we're spending on war rather than on human services. You know, we need health care, we need affordable housing, we need living wages, we need to educate our children, we need to protect the environment. We're on the cusp of Dr. Of, of, uh, Martin Luther King Day, and of course that was something he emphasized yeah. uh, in speaking out against Vietnam, because the resources that went into that war were not resources that were available to lift people out of poverty, to exactly. create jobs programs, to do other things. So that's really yeah. the solution is let's stop doing these short-sighted things right. or playing into the, the greed that is the basis for so much of our, uh, you know, our involvement in war, and let's let's try to chart a different way. Yes, I, exactly, and I, I think, um, you know, the whole issue of oil, you know, it has come into this thing in terms of why why we support Saudi Arabia and, you know, Iran because of the sanctions really couldn't, you know, get the money from their own oil and their soil. Um, and, and so that has been an issue, and so climate change and the need for sustainable solutions, it, it's all connected. And you used a very short answer, very optimistic. Do you think we can find a way through this? We have to. We have to, and I'm doing it for my grandchildren. <laughs> all right. Bonnie Block, thanks so much for joining us Thank once you. again for a marvelous conversation. you become our honorary peace-focused <laughs> peace uh, foreign correspondent for Forward <laughs> Forum, so thanks. This has been Forward Forum. Forward Forum Show at gmail.com mm -hmm. is a place where you can find out more, or you can contact us here at the Sun Prairie okay. Media Center. Uh, either via email or phone uh, with your suggestions, your feedback on our current programs, your ideas for future programs. Thank you so much for joining us. Please send warm thoughts and prayers for peace and have a great week.